Here's what's coming up on episode 23 of the Summit for Wellness podcast. I would describe to other practitioners, well, this is what I want to do. I want to help people in an unconventional way, but I want to be able to look at all systems, not just focus on, you know, I had studied Feldenkrais. I didn't want to just focus on movement and muscular skeletal issues. I wanted to focus on internal medicine. When your hormone production starts to change, it shifts over to other parts of the body that make the hormones that are declining. So with perimenopause, first progesterone declines for most women, and then later estrogen. And bacteria in your gut do a huge part of metabolizing and processing out your hormones. So they say, you know, some people will say your gut microbiome controls your hormones because not only do bacteria process out the hormones, but to a certain extent, the bacteria in your gut make hormones. The biggest complaints you'll hear about perimenopause are more like period problems and mood stuff. And then later you tend, when estrogen declines, you tend to hear more about hot flashes and night sweats. This varies from person to person, but hot flashes and sweating are, can be really uncomfortable, especially if it's extreme and happening frequently. And the worst part is the sleep disruption. So if it's happening at night and you're not getting, women aren't getting a good night's sleep, that can really mess you up in a lot of ways. Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 23 of the Summit for Wellness podcast. I am your host, Brian Carroll, and I hope that everyone had a fantastic Thanksgiving weekend. We took a little break from the podcast just to celebrate Thanksgiving, but we are back and we've had quite a few interviews the last couple of weeks with a bunch of different professionals. And today's episode, uh, we talked about in our last episode a little bit, and this one is for all the women out there that are in perimenopause and transitioning into menopause. And we asked a lot of our listeners what are some struggles that they are having with this transitional period of their life. And so I brought on an expert that specializes in female health and female hormones to discuss a lot of these issues. I think there are a lot of negative connotations about uh, women's health and the hormonal changes that women go through. So I think this type of episode is extremely important to open up a safe place to discuss these issues that women go through and give some solutions to uh, women to be able to reduce some of their symptoms and to have a better time going through these big changes within their lives. So that is the idea behind this episode, and our guest, Laura Paris, is a fantastic uh, specialist in this field, and so I think if you are going through this stage of your life, you will gain a lot of valuable information from this episode. Before we get into it, we have a couple announcements. Um, This Wednesday at 12, that's noon Pacific Standard Time, we will be having our first live Q&A session in our uh, health and wellness Facebook group. So if you go to summitforwellness.com slash tribe, you can join in to the Facebook group and you can submit your questions for our live Q&As. And this provides an opportunity for us to connect with a lot more people and to be able to answer their questions. But if anyone has a much larger question that we would like to answer in a much deeper level, then we will definitely take those ideas and bring them to the podcast so that all of you listeners can hear these questions as well. 
And our second announcement as we go into the holiday season here is that we really want people to make sure that they are taking care of themselves, especially when there's a lot of stress with the holidays and family matters and all sorts of stuff coming out. So uh, one of the products that we love to use during stressful periods of time or when we're doing high levels of activity is called HANA1. And if you go to summitforwellness.com slash H-A-N-A-H, you can learn more about HANA. But essentially, it is a blend of about 30 different herbs that help with the regulation of stress levels within the body. And it's an Ayurvedic blend, and it's something that I have been using and absolutely love. And I, I use it a lot when I'm on my backpacking trips and ice climbing trips because it just supplies me with that little extra bit of energy while at the same time nourishing my cells and nourishing my body. So I am a big believer in herbal products. I have felt the power of herbs and how it can support the system as it's working through various illnesses or different stages of life. So I was on a lot of herbal products when I was going through some mold issues that I was dealing with, and the power of the herbs themselves were just magnificent, and that's what got me to start looking into the world of traditional Chinese medicine and start creating my own products that way is because of the power of the herbal products. So I definitely believe in the power of herbs with supporting the system during stressful periods of time. So go to summitforwellness.com slash H-A-N-A-H to get your jar of HANA 1. Okay, without further ado, let's go and have a little chat with Laura Paris all about female hormones and regulating the female body as it prepares for menopause. Our guest today is Laura Paris, and she uses functional medicine, nutrition, and acupuncture to help women of all ages achieve vibrant hormone health. From adolescent and the start of menstrual cycles through reproductive years, perimenopause, and beyond, she is passionate about solving hormone imbalances. She writes a women's health blog and is launching an online program for hormone and gut health with two of her colleagues. Welcome, Laura, to our show. Thank you, Brian. It's good to be here. I'm really excited to have you on here because we reached out to a lot of my listeners and we're asking them uh, some of the areas that they wanted to learn more about. And we had an overwhelming number of people respond about female hormones and going through that big transition in their life into menopause. And you're one of those experts out there that's talking all about this. So I'm glad to have you here. I'm very glad to talk about it too. It, it's a great topic to delve into. A lot of women and men don't know what to expect and the information that's out there is confusing. So it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Yeah. And let's go back in time a little bit. Can you talk to us about what brought you to this point in your career and what uh, made you focus more on female hormones and female health? Well, it's interesting. It was kind of a circling around when I think about it, because when I went to college, I went for fine arts. And then when I was there, I went to a college. It wasn't just an art school. Uh, it was Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. They happened to have a really strong women's studies program. And I took a couple of their classes and I got very interested in it and just hadn't had much exposure to uh, women's issues and from a feminist perspective. And it was fascinating. And then I ended up getting a double major in women's studies and fine arts, which didn't give me the right kind of background to go study medicine. But that came later, and that came with uh, my move from the Midwest to California to San Francisco. And I started exploring all these sort of alternative movement and health things that were really big in San Francisco that were not in the Midwest at that time. So I, I got very into yoga, and I started using acupuncture as my primary health treatment modality. 
And then I eventually discovered the Feldenkrais method and I, I fell in love with that. And so I was exposed to a lot of things. And when I decided to go back to school, I wanted to do a graduate program that where I could use, I could study some kind of healing that was unconventional that would also allow me to specialize in women's health from kind of an activist or feminist perspective. And I chose, at that point in time, functional medicine wasn't a thing. And I, so I decided if I studied Chinese medicine, to me, it was the closest thing to functional medicine in terms of looking at people really holistically. And we can talk more about that. But so I started studying Chinese medicine, but my, my goal was to always study nutrition and, uh, unconventional lab tests and ways to evaluate and assess people finding root cause and root patterns rather than just masking symptoms. So I went through many, many years of studying and then ended up in a practice where I uh, specialized in women's health. And that for a long time, that was primarily focused more around fertility and pregnancy. And it might have just had something to do with my age at the time because I was having around the same time having my son and I was at an age where that's what I was doing with my life. And now because I'm 52 and menopause is the thing that I'm going through in my life, it seems just kind of a natural evolution of the clientele that I'm working with, that I'm working with more menopausal women. And there's something powerful there uh, when you're going through a certain stage of life to be able to connect with the people that are going through those very similar stages in their own lives too. Would you say that's true? Definitely. I mean, you can, it really, I always welcome different experiences in life because I know even if they're difficult, that it's going to help me connect with a person that comes to me that has a similar experience. Yeah. And I find it fascinating that you would, delved into more of the functional medicine approach before it was a thing here in the States, uh, because I feel like that's something that's transitioning more into the mainstream media now. And back when you were going through it, it's something that was not very heard of very often and more probably what people would consider to be a little bit woo woo. Yes. And I think when, I think when I first was interested in Chinese medicine, I don't think that term functional medicine had been coined at all. And I would describe to other practitioners, well, this is what I want to do. I want to help people in an unconventional way, but I want to be able to look at all systems, not just focus on, you know, I had studied Feldenkrais. I didn't want to just focus on movement and muscular skeletal issues. I wanted to focus on internal medicine. Um, and Chinese medicine was the old, was the branch of medicine that had been around for a very long time and look, looks at people through a systems approach. And that's why sometimes it's kind of funny when functional medicine, which is getting a lot of press right now, more popularity. People think it's this brand new thing, but if you look at what defines it, which is basically that getting to root cause patterns that lie underneath people's symptoms and kind of hooking all their symptoms together into uh, similar key root causes and working that way, that approach, you know, has always been around in Chinese medicine, just not called functional. And then functional medicine also 
there's the aspect of using very cutting edge modern laboratory testing. So there's that piece as well that distinguishes it from um, more traditional medicine, like Chinese medicine. Yeah, and like we talked about before we started recording, um, it's so much more mainstream now with functional medicine, and we think of it as this new idea of how to treat the body, and yet for a very long time, the Eastern medicine has been looking at root causes and how to treat it. It's just we're getting a little bit more advanced with um, all the technology that we have now that we can treat, but doesn't necessarily mean that using herbs and uh, different nutrients and whatnot is something that's no longer on the table to be able to treat diseases or illnesses or um, whatever is going on within sub someone's body. Right. Yeah. It, the combination is really nice. It's like the combining the tools of the West with the tools of Chinese medicine and, and other herbs as well, and putting that together and including the diagnostic tools. Cause I'll, I'll use the great functional medicine lab test, but I'll also use conventional blood work. And I'll also use Chinese medicine assessment when I work with people in person. And it's great to have those different ways of, of looking different lenses to look through. For sure. I totally agree with that. Now, going into our topic of the day, which is perimenopause and menopause, you can still take that same concept of looking for root causes and you can help support women as they're going through these phases. And um, it's interesting because there is a bio-individual component to every single person going through this stage of life, but there is root cause things that we can look at to help support them to not have as drastic changes uh, in this stage. Is that correct? Yes, I would definitely agree with that. So in Chinese medicine, as you're aware of, because because you have some knowledge of it as well. If someone comes for menopause symptoms, they don't get the same diagnosis as the next person. So there's different patterns and different diagnoses that go on with, let's say, just a symptom of hot flash. So it's not always the same thing. And there could be a pattern of... Um, in Chinese medicine, they call it yin deficiency with empty heat rising. And that's a common menopause pattern, but it can be, there can be other patterns as well. And to really treat that person appropriately, that woman, you need to figure out which pattern she falls into for it to work. So with functional medicine, we have all this X, we have all this additional information about what, how to assess that woman and what is out of basically what about out of balance in her life internally and externally that would cause more suffering compared to someone who's not. Right. So let's, let's start at perimenopause and let's kind of walk through what are some areas of someone's life that you would be looking at when to help them prepare for menopause, both internally and externally. So that's a great question. And it, Perimenopause, which is basically just means the time before menopause and when your hormones start a gradual shift. And that can be different lengths of time for different women. It could span over 10 years easily. And what happens, usually women in this country during perimenopause are really busy. And it's a hard time for them to think about self-care because a lot of them are very busy with careers or kids or both. And then they might, often the women I'll work with are, they're in perimenopause and they, they start to have problems that they feel are hormone related and that's when I'll see them. So what we first want to do, and this goes with functional medicine and, and it also goes with Chinese medicine, it's the, the same philosophy as that. When your hormone production starts to change, it shifts over to 
other parts of the body that make the hormones that are declining. So with perimenopause, first progesterone declines for most women, and then later estrogen. And other hormones production can decline too, but those are the big ones. And really what's happening is the ovaries are shutting down their production of those hormones, not completely, but, but significantly. And then we, we rely primarily on adrenal glands to make the same hormones. So the adrenal glands can make all of the, what we call glucosteroid hormones, including progesterone, estrogen, adrenal hormones like cortisol and DHEA, but also um, testosterone. So since we rely on our adrenal glands, what we want working really well during perimenopause is our adrenal gland system. And that's, that's where we start, functional medicine and Chinese medicine both. So when you're taking a look at the adrenal system, what would you be looking at uh, in order to support it? So we would look at the symptoms of that system being off. And we used to call it, when that system was off, we used to call it adrenal fatigue. So probably a lot of people have heard that term, adrenal fatigue. And that was used in naturopathic medicine. It was used in functional medicine. Um, Chinese medicine would have other words for it. But really what it is, it's not just, it's not about your adrenal glands so much. It's Your adrenal glands are these two little uh, glands sitting on top of your kidneys. And they don't have intelligence, so to speak. So they're directed by your your brain and your nervous system signaling the adrenal glands what to put out. So when we work with the adrenal glands, therapeutically, we work with the communication between the adrenal glands and the brain, specifically hypothalamus and pituitary. So the term HPA axis evolved, and that's hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis and how they're communicating as a system. So, so that's what we want to want to work with therapeutically. But the symptoms of that system being out of whack usually fall into stress, energy, and sleep. So if you feel, if a woman feels, has insomnia, that's a sign of HPA dysfunction, any sleep disruption really. And then daytime energy slumps, other things like weakness or difficulty recovering from exercise, blood sugar instability, and then stress. Your How do you handle stress? Do you feel bowled over by stress? Do you feel anxious? So these are all things we'll ask. And then if someone has a lot of signs and symptoms in that area, then we'll go further with testing. Do you have a specific test that you like to do? I do use, like to use the Dutch hormone test. It's, it has nothing to do with Dutch. It just stands for dry urine uh, hormone testing comprehensive hormone testing, and they came up with that acronym. But so it's it's using dried urine specimens to measure the metabolites of sex hormones, ad all adrenal hormones, and melatonin as well. And it gives, doing that test gives you information into all of those systems. Basically, the, the one... The two hormone systems, it doesn't give a window into our thyroid and and insulin and blood sugar, but it gives you all this great information about reproductive hormones and how they're metabolizing and then how the how someone's cortisol production is overall. Cortisol versus cortisone, what the rhythm is like, what the metabolism is like. And you can get a pretty good picture of if they fall into HPA dysfunction 
from that test and what kind of dysfunction. So is it because it gets more complex than just saying, oh, you have high cortisol and that's why you're having a hard time sleeping. Maybe that's why you're gaining weight. It might not be. It could be that a woman has high cortisol at night, but low during the day. So her curve could be kind of upside down, so to speak, because cortisol should be rising in the morning and then slowly declining in the afternoon and then really low at night. And it's pretty rare if I see a woman who has a lot of stress and perimenopausal symptoms, it's pretty rare that that curve is going to show up perfect. There's usually something off about it that we can address. So do you find that um, women in this stage of life, perimenopause, who are also, you know, also in a really busy state of their life too, if they have kids, if they're getting to that point in their career where they're advancing further and getting higher up, and all of this that's playing on HPA access dysfunction, do you find that this um, uh, dysfunction tends to happen more in people in this age range than any other age range? That's a really interesting question. I would say yes and no, because it certainly can happen to women in the perimenopausal age range. So we'll call that like, let's say 35 to 50. So often women in that in that age range are having young children, um, whereas that didn't used to be the case. And I have to say, I mean, I was a mature mom. I had my son when I was 38. And I think it's physically harder to have kids in your 40s to have little kids than it is when you're younger. Just It's just biology. And then at this age, we're often taking care of older parents as well. So being in that sandwich generation, taking care of kids, taking care of parents, and then also working, you know, not, not everyone's working, but a lot of people, if they're not working, they're doing a lot of work raising kids. Um, So most women are either juggling both or, or one. But however, there's always exceptions, like some, some people undergo a lot of stress at you know, at any time in their life, just depending on what the external stressors are. So sometimes I'll, I'll work with women who basically, if we want to assess HPA dysfunction, it's really talking about, okay, what kind of stress have you experienced in your life? And have you experienced acute traumatic stress that you feel like was never resolved? And that's one of the questions on my intake form. And I'm surprised by how often that is answered with yes. So I think a lot of women identify like, oh, yeah, you know, big stuff happened when I was a teenager, when I was a child, you know, earlier in life that I don't feel like I ever dealt with and has always affected me. Um, And then another question will be, do you feel like you deal with chronic stress? And that is, it's almost always a yes. So these are, this is a time in life where that, that's going to show up going into these hormonal changes, because if stress hasn't been resolved and is affecting you, not just physically with the HPA dysfunction, but also emotionally or how you've set up your life, um, how you're managing your stress, how you're perceiving it, how you take care of yourself, um, all these aspects. It's going to, when you go through hormonal changes, you're just going to feel them uh, more. You're going to feel them harder, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'm really curious about that conversation that you have with these women, because you're, you're going into, you know, what their lifestyles like where they are emotionally, um, whether they're in a supportive type of relationship. And so you're stepping into a lot of components of someone's life, which for someone coming to you, 
it's really nice to have someone asking about those areas of your life, but you trying to tell them, you know, these are areas we want to work on, that can also be a tough change for people to make. So how do you have that conversation? Yeah, I, it is true. And for one thing, I, I do not ever approach working with someone by telling them, well, you should do this, this, and this, like get it together (laughs) because (laughs) we're all in this together. We're all human and we all have our coping mechanisms and ways of surviving. And I, so I have a lot of empathy and no judgment. And I, I think people feel that right away. And, you know, also I'm not a, I'm not a therapist. So even though when I work with women, I do put in a lot of time and we do talk about life stuff. We talk about how's your sex life? How's your, your primary relationship if there is one? And we'll talk about this stuff. I find that Women are usually really, if they're coming to work with me, they, they're the type, they're self-selected. They're usually the type of, of woman that is happy to be able to talk to someone and have more support and have someone on their team that they can be real with. So usually it's easy, but then in terms of tackling what needs to change, that can vary across the board. I mean, it can be it can be, you know, someone needs to get out of a, a, an abusive relationship. It can be that, you know, intense to um, somebody needs to change their relationship with their job, which can also can be really difficult, too. But um, usually we find, like, what is the thing that's going to move the needle the most in your life in terms of stress and harmony what's going to harmonize your life the most and not try to make everything perfect, but just identify what, what might be the key imbalances and women realize that it's, that it's, it's not just a physical thing. And that's why I might like, just with any kind of condition, we, we might go to a doctor or we might go to an herbalist and say, how can you stop the symptom? You know, how can you stop these hot flashes? I don't want to take hormones. They're not safe. So what herb can you give me that will just knock these out? That's not usually the clientele that I get. And it's usually just not that simple. Because that approach is just not that different from a conventional approach. It's like, how can you get rid of the symptom by taking something? So I'll explain right away. Well, you can't really supplement your way out of this. We have to look at the whole picture. And usually they're really glad to. And they want that support. You know, you made a couple really good points there. The first one I really liked was you talking about what piece of your puzzle is going to move that needle the most. And I really like that visual. The second piece you brought up too was we are so trained for that one pill that fixes everything. And I think that's why so many people uh, don't think herbs work or specific supplements work because they expect one pill like one calcium pill is supposed to fix my bones forever. And that's not how the body actually works. And that's not how these type of herbs and supplements are made to be used in order to support the system. They're, as you said, they're a support. They're a supplement to the rest of your lifestyle and your diet and everything else that's going on in your life. Exactly. So you would say in perimenopause that if we can support the person here and we're able to get them to start thinking about where their stress levels are, then as they start to transition into into menopause, then their symptoms are going to be less severe. Is that what you're getting at here? Yes. And physically... Besides just the HPA axis, we're looking at also just hormone levels and hormone metabolism. That's important to look at because 
estrogen dominance can often be a factor. And it's worth just touching on that. So estrogen dominance basically just means the um, too much estrogen relative to progesterone. So I like to think about it in terms of Chinese medicine, that there's a yin and a yang balance between estrogen and progesterone. And when estrogen is bigger than progesterone, there can be symptoms of imbalance that are like perimenopausal symptoms or light premenstrual symptoms. So there can be a lot of moodiness, um, often irritability, uh, anger, resentment, those kind of moods. There can be, uh, women can have tender breasts uh, premenstrually or during their period, more um, bloating, uh, cramps, pain, so a lot of symptoms can be from estrogen dominance, and there's no way to really guess that. So that's where I do like testing. So not only the Dutch test, but I'll also just do blood blood work and see where hormones are at. And if they're, so their estrogen dominance, because earlier I said progesterone declines before estrogen, there's a certain period of time where it's natural to have some estrogen dominance going into menopause. However, because of our environment, it tends to be worse. And what I mean by that is it's because we're exposed to so many estrogens in our environment and what we call endocrine disruptors. So those are chemicals in our environment and we can reduce our exposure to them, but we can't eliminate it. And so when those get into the body and Disrupt, disrupt our endocrine system, they act as what we call xenoestrogens, which means foreign estrogen. But they'll still take up receptor sites for, for natural estro, estrogen on our cells, but they're damaging and they're harmful and they're toxic and they create a false estrogen dominance. So part of the education we'll do in perimenopause is weeding out as much of that stuff as possible from, from someone's environment to weed out the xenoestrogens and see if there's estrogen dominance, see how the estrogen's metabolizing. So we can test if it's metabolizing into, metabolizing well out through detoxification through the liver or if it's not metabolizing well and turning into metabolites that increase risk of cancer. And since we can see that, we can, we can help shape that by doing various things to support the positive metabolism of estrogen. And that's one of the things in perimenopause where I really stress, hey, if, we, if you've never looked at how your estrogen metabolizes, now's the, a really good time to do that. Can you talk about a couple endocrine disruptors just so people know what to look for in their environment? Yes. Um, so the things that I always start with, well, here's what you have control over. So plastics, any plastic that gets heated is going to leach chemicals. So BPA is one of the well-known ones and um, there's other ones as well. So basically, to try to get plastic out of your life related to food, especially, or anything you ingest. So water bottles, um, storage containers um, with for food. And then if you do need to, and there's great substitutions. There's, um, there's steel, stainless steel, and there's glass. And there's more cool things coming out all the time. Like now they have the steel uh, bottles that are thermal that will keep a beverage cold or warm. And those are safe, but any, if you're going to use plastic at all, don't use it if it's been warmed up. So if it's been heated, if it's been microwaved, if it's been sitting in the sun, because you're going to be taking in a lot, a lot, a big load of those chemicals. And so that's something we can control. And the other thing is products that we use on our body or in our house for cleaning. They can have chemicals that are endocrine disruptors. And there's 
there's great websites where you can go and actually find out about products that you use and if they're on the safe list. And so maybe later I could give you those sites and you could include them on the in the notes. Yeah, I'll, I'll include all that into the show notes. That'd be great. Yeah. And then um, your yard or if you, if you own property or are taking care of your yard or have any say in it, um, you know, now we know that Roundup, which we, a lot of people used to think was safe. Now we know that Roundup is um, for sure causes cancer. So, you know, ideally you're not using any chemicals in your yard, any fertilizers or pesticides. Um, so if you can control that, like your house, your products that you use to clean and your body and plastics and pesticides in your yard, that's making a huge step into what you're exposed to. Okay, that's all great information to know. Yeah. Um, some other things that people don't really think about too is like the receipts you get at the stores that all c contains endocrine disruptors as well. So there's a lot of things out there that can um, definitely cause some uh, estrogen dominance in the body. Right. Receipts are, nobody really knows about that one, The or very few people do. And it's so unfortunate because even if you say in the checkout, I don't want the receipt because you know touching that ink is going to get into your body it, and it's, it's quite toxic, then still the person working at the register is like, okay, and then they're crumbling it up and touching it more. And it would be great if the, you know, the retail industry knew about that and stopped using that material. So if anyone has any uh, say in the retail industry to change everything over to email receipts or something like that, then please do that for all of us out here. <laughs> exactly. And if any store offers that, take them up on it. If they offer no receipt or email receipt, do that. Okay, so let's, uh, you talked a little bit about the liver and how the liver processes estrogen in the body and the detoxification pathways. Can you dive a little deeper into that? And how does that relate into, let's say, hot flashes or night sweats and ev all the other symptoms within menopause? Sure. So with that, I like to also just think about the gut and the microbiome. Um, of course. Yeah, as part of the liver. So there's basically three phases of detoxification. The, and the first two are primarily liver dependent. So the liver t makes the hormones, makes your hormones, which are fats, fat based, um, and as well as uh, the hormones from the environment, takes them through the first step of detoxification into a water soluble compound that is then further metabolized through six different major channels. And some of them people may have heard about, the more common ones are methylation, sulfation, and you need the right basically ingredients from your diet, from your nutrition for these steps to happen. And then the liver will push out um, toxins primarily through actually the gallbladder, through the bile into your intestines, and then to go out and be further processed by the bacteria in your gut. And bacteria in your gut do a huge part of metabolizing and processing out your hormones. So they say, you know, some people will say your gut microbiome controls your hormones because not only do bacteria process out the hormones, but to a certain extent, the bacteria in your gut make hormones. So this is like a, to a whole topic in itself for you know another, another time, but it's really important to look at gut health for hormone metabolism and healthy hormones. So liver and gut health. And what the phase three part is the pulling out of toxins and hormone metabolites through the digestive tract. 
And so often there's a backup in phase one, two, or three. And it's good to find out, you know, which area might be struggling to know how to address it. And often that can be figured out just by symptoms alone. And then there's also tests you can do to see how someone's detoxifying and see what their microbiome is like and if there's any overgrowths of things you don't want, bacterial, yeast, parasite, or if there's a if there's a lack of things that you do want that the bacteria make, that the good bacteria make, including a lack of beneficial bacteria. So these are areas when the liver and the microbiome are functioning well, it will make hormonal life so much smoother. Can you describe why that would make everything so much smoother? Okay, so let's say in the case of of estrogen dominance. So a huge part of estrogen dominance can be, I mean, you want to be able to remove excess or harmful estrogen out of the body. So that involves the liver and then the gut bacteria. And you have to be eliminating well. So that means pooping every day. And it's amazing how many people don't. And they'll say, oh, yeah, once every three days, maybe. That's not good enough. It has to be every day so that um, hormone metabolites can move through. If they don't move through, they'll get reabsorbed. And then there'll be more estrogen. And it'll it'll make uh, estrogen dominance worse. So that's one example. Um Another example is if you don't have enough beneficial bacteria, they're not going to produce the things that they're supposed to produce. So one of the things that gets produced in the intestinal tract is serotonin, which is we think of more as a neurotransmitter than a hormone. But serotonin has a lot to do with hot flashes. And that's why in Western conventional medicine now, they're treating hot flashes with low doses of antidepressants that raise, that recycle serotonin. So those are called the SSRI medications. And there's a bunch of them that have been approved to treat hot flashes. Um, Several different brands have gotten like, so they're not being used off label, they're being used They're marketed for that purpose. And we can get serotonin production. So 90% of your serotonin is produced in your GI tract. And you need enough good bacteria for that to happen. So we can help that production by improving the microbiome and gut health. And then with more serotonin, with enough serotonin, women are less likely to experience hot flashes and night sweats specifically because those are considered vasomotor symptoms and they don't understand. We don't understand why they occur still. We have ideas, but we really don't have a complete understanding of it. But what we we know is that when there's sufficient serotonin, there are less symptoms like that. And then... Serotonin in the aspect of moods can make a difference too, because if women feel more unstable mood-wise, irritable, depressed, anxious, that could also be related to low serotonin levels. I feel like I just went off in a bunch of different directions there, but... No, I love it. And it it's super fascinating because one a lot of people don't understand that your microbiome and your gut affects the functionality of your brain and there's a lot of research coming out with that with Datis Karazian who's been talking about functional neurology and making that gut brain connection and there's a lot of others talking about the gut and the brain um so it's it's really nice to see how all of that is coming together especially in a scenario like going through menopause but it also shows people that one pill is not going to fix all of these different 
systems within the body. As we can now see, it's all connected together in some way. And so you have to try and figure out the root causes and support the system all the way through the process, internally and externally, in order to reduce the excess symptoms. Exactly. It's really the best way to go. And it's, it is fascinating how the research is really in the direction of the microbiome and the microbiome, you know, we often call it its own organ because of it has the microbiome in our gut has is comparable to our livers in terms of an organ that does so many things and is so important. And we're just kind of at the beginning of starting to tap into understanding that and how to work with that. And I really look forward to how that's going to keep developing over time and our our knowledge of how to improve that because we're so we're so at the beginning. We just know now that, yeah, it's probably not a good idea to take a lot of antibiotics and wipe out all of our bacteria that we've cultivated um, usually and we have or use antibacterial soaps everywhere and things like that. We're we're just starting to realize how important our bacteria is. And uh, some people are still really grossed out by thinking about it and talking about it. Yeah, it's it's definitely a whole new world and just in even the last couple of years the testing that you can do on the microbiome has changed completely. And right now it's kind of at that point where it's information and we don't fully know the proper ratios of what things are supposed to be in the gut yet and we're still trying to figure it out but at least we can gather that information now and start seeing um, uh, relationships within the microbiome within people's guts right right it's yeah it's very cool and they there's research also going into for women going through menopause into analyzing vaginal microbiome and how that changes with hormone changes and how to work with that. And that's really interesting. And Ubiome, which is one of the citizen science projects that can analyze your gut microbiome, they're now, they now have a vaginal profile, um, which is really interesting. But they, uh, you can send them a sample and for a relatively low amount of money, they can they can analyze your entire microbiome, what's, what's living there. Um, and the sample, the area is different. Like you can send them a gut sample or um, I think they do nasal sinus and now they do vaginal. Yeah, I didn't realize you biome did so many different uh, specimens. I thought they just did the gut, so that's really good to know. Yeah, they're expanding. And then the next step is understanding the data because... Yeah, there's a lot to it. Yeah. The first time I did a U-Biome sample, it was very difficult to know what to do with it because my understanding wasn't as involved, as in-depth as it is now. So that part's coming along too. It's kind of like with genetic testing. We can do, we can, we can get 23andMe or another service to, to crack our code, but then what to do with it is a whole nother thing. If anything, if anything, right? Yeah. Like I said, it's right now it's information that at some point we might be able to crack, but right now it's, it's kind of a mind boggle for us. Scientists know what they're doing. We don't. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We're just at, yeah, we're just starting. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to throw a little curveball at you since we were talking about the, the gut microbiome and the liver. What do you think of people just going on these random, uh, liver cleanses, especially as we're about to enter the new year where everybody wants to have a new you and they go on to these, I don't know, five day cleanses, 21 day cleanses, and all these rapid weight loss programs and all sorts of stuff. Oh gosh. Um, well definitely liver cleansing has its place and, you know, in Chinese medicine, there's times of the year that make more sense to do that. For example, spring, 
because it's a season in Chinese medicine of the liver. So it's a nice time to do a little gentle uh, spring cleaning of the liver. But really our liver is detoxing and cleaning all year round. So I like the idea of supporting that all year round with just some little lifestyle tweaks. Like for example, one of them is just maybe extending the time between when you eat or drink to give your gut and liver a chance to self-clean and to rest. So people don't think of that. So I'll, I'll promote that a lot with people is just, yeah, having, see if you can eat and drink enough so that you can go for four hours without having to eat and drink more. I mean, drinking water or tea or something is less of an issue, but it can even so some people will say, yeah, I go four hours and I drink tons of water in between because anytime I'm hungry or feel hunger, I'll just drink a bunch of water or tea. But even that actually will slow down the process of the of the gut self cleaning because then your gut senses distension in your stomach and the process of the migrating motor complex in your small intestine might not kick in. And that's a wave of digestion that only happens with an empty stomach. And it's not really digestion. It's more like sweeping the bacteria and just gunk through your, through your gut. It's just kind of a sweeping wave. And that's not going to happen if your stomach isn't empty. So it's almost like feeling that rumbling of an empty stomach is actually a good thing. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> kind of crazy, huh? I mean, you know, given that you are actually eating enough, it's, right. it's okay to feel that noise because it means that your migrating motor complex is working and you're getting to the point of cleaning out. If you're constantly eating, like some people think, the old, the old school idea is that you should eat frequently throughout the day, but that's not really how it's worked from an evolutionary point of view for humans. It's more been that, you know, maybe we'll eat a whole bunch and then not eat for a, a while. And our bodies are meant to go through that. Right. I like that answer. Thank you for, um, Going on that little journey with me, side tangent. Oh, but one more thing about the cleaning um, is that I do see people who come in um, really messed up after doing some extreme liver cleanse. And I see you in Chinese medicine, in order to do cleansing, you need to have a strong constitution. So you don't do like radical cleansing pretty much ever, but especially if you're weak or if you're sick. And most Americans are weak in some ways, metabolically, and they shouldn't go into a harsh cleanse or definitely not, you know, a crazy low calorie diet, which will probably just screw up your metabolism. So I do see people who come in and say, I've had this problem ever since I did this liver cleanse thing. And it's unfortunate. And from a lot of the training I've had too, um, you don't want to do any harsh cleansings when the elimination pathways aren't fully open because then you're distributing uh, essentially toxins throughout the body and not having a clear way of eliminating it out of the system too. That's so true. Yeah, you definitely need things open and definitely stool. So if you're not, <laughs> back to pooping, if you're not pooping every day, don't, <laughs> don't go on a cleanse because it's just going to back up. And so yeah. first get the elimination going. Okay. Since we are getting close to the end of time, I do want to jump into some of the symptom solutions. Um, and since you have a background with acupuncture, Chinese uh, medicine, herbology, I would love to get some um solutions that might be helpful for people going through these stages of their life. Definitely. If anyone's listened this far, they definitely deserve some take homes. <laughs> exactly. So um, as far as, I mean, the biggest complaints 
you'll hear about perimenopause are more like period problems and mood stuff. And then later you tend, when estrogen declines, you tend to hear more about hot flashes and night sweats. This varies from person to person, but hot flashes and sweating are, can be really uncomfortable, especially if it's extreme and happening frequently. And the worst part is the sleep disruption. So if it's happening at night and you're not getting, women aren't getting a good night's sleep, that can really mess you up in a lot of ways. So first thing to do is identify any triggers for hot flashes. And some people don't think about this, but uh, common triggers are, are spicy food, um, caffeine can be a trigger. Alcohol is a big trigger. And for some reason, red wine tends to be more of a trigger than other types of alcohol. Some women, sugar is a, a trigger. Um, stress, if you, you know, we talked a lot about that, but stress is a trigger. Hot weather can make them worse. Heating yourself up in general to an extreme, like hot tubs and saunas can, can be a trigger. Smoking, for sure. And then just unexpressed emotions, especially uh, anger and resentment. Resentment is kind of bottled up anger. Um, women aren't, we don't, I mean, our, men and women in this culture, we don't tend to have good outlets for anger, which is a normal, natural emotion. And in Chinese medicine, anger is stored in the liver. So the liver controls anger and you get stagnation in your liver if you're not expressing your anger. So all of these things can be hot flesh triggers. And sometimes women really nail it to a certain thing. Like they'll say, well, I've always had my two glasses of wine at night to take the edge off. And this is a huge thing for women. There are so many women who are taking the edge off with one or two glasses of wine every night. And so I've, I've heard women say they had to, they have to give it up completely. Or some women find out if I just stick to a quarter of a glass of this type of wine, I'm okay. And so, um, yeah, alcohol is a whole topic, topic in itself. But sometimes if you just find one of these triggers, you realize it's so worth letting it go for a while to lessen the suffering. And then beyond triggers, there's, there's a, many things that can help with the symptoms, either the emotional symptoms that, um, or the brain symptoms. So brain fog, emotional can be anxiety, depression, irritability, just feeling off. Um, and before periods actually stop, sometimes the emotional things or the symptoms can be stronger premenstrually, not always, but often. So for there's, I mean, I'll take a Chinese herbal approach because Chinese herbology is the most sophisticated form of herbology and takes into account balancing the person from every angle, including the temperature of the herb. So we look at, well, we don't want to use hot herbs when someone's hot flashing. We want to use herbs that have a cooling nature to them. And Western herbology does not focus on temperature in the way that Chinese herbology does. And they also tend to focus more on single herbs instead of a combination of herbs that work as a formula together. However, there's still value in that. They just tend to be used more what I call allopathically, like, yeah, take black cohosh for your hot flash. And that can actually be very effective for a certain percentage of people. It doesn't always last, but it's worth a try. So the herbs that tend to help with hot flashes can be, uh, Western herbs can be black cohosh, um, the, uh, sage, chase tree, or also known as vitex. 
maca and pomegranate are kind of the newer, not newer herbs, but more popular recently. Um, maca is getting a lot of popularity. There's a brand called Femme Essence that a lot of women are taking. Um, just so you know, maca tends to do a lot of different things in the body and, and it's viewed as an adrenal adaptogen. We don't know why it helps hot flashes if it does, but it could be because it's working as an adrenal adaptogen and helping that system. Uh, maca tends to be one that might help sex drive and libido more, which is always good to know. And then recently, pomegranate seed oil is kind of new on the on the scene. And there's there's been some research that shows significant improvements in all domains of menopause symptoms. So and the um, each each one has a different dosage. And of course, the source of herbs is is important. Um, so we can, I can, we can include some of that in the, in the notes. And then last, lastly, just phytoestrogens are, they've been around for a long time. And some people think phytoestrogen is bad, like a xenoestrogen. But for women who are low in estrogen going through menopause, phytoestrogens can be, work wonders. And they, they're actually, they can modulate estrogen so that if you have too much in the case of dominance or too just too low as in the case of normal menopause phytoestrogens can help modulate either one and the foods and herbs that tend to be high in phytoestrogens are soy red clover flax seeds bioflavonoids so those are examples of those yeah that's all fantastic information. And I really appreciate you coming on and talking about uh, ways to get through this big stage for women, uh, especially since so many people in my audience is at this stage currently. So I think this will definitely help them to be able to start transitioning through and um, be able to reduce their symptoms. Now, do you work with uh, patients only in person or do you work uh, virtually as well? I do both. It, I, it's probably 50-50. So in person, I work in Monterey and Santa Cruz, California. And then virtually, I um, just work with people in the U.S. And that will be either phone or video. So if anybody listening has... Um, questions that you would like answered, Laura is definitely the expert to go to to uh, work through these uh, problems and solutions with. And she also has a website at uh, parishealingarts.com. Laura, do you have any other um, online channels that you work through, like Facebook or anything like that? I do have a Facebook presence, um, and that's Laura Paris Healing Arts. Awesome. And I know that you are a writer and you like to uh, write a bunch of blog posts and whatnot on your website. So there's a lot of information that people can find on your website as well. So that is great. Are there any final things you would like to tell the audience or to uh, send out to the world? Um, yeah, it's worth mentioning that a couple of colleagues and I are putting together a program that's like a hormone reset program. It's going to be an eight week program and it's going to be uh, virtual, but with actual contact as well. I mean, not just a program that you're on your own with. You'll be, women will be part of a active group and have interaction with the three of us. And we're really excited because we're gonna we're gonna bring in some Chinese medicine components. Two of us are licensed acupuncturists, and the third one is a OBGYN, functional medicine. And we're gonna put all of our stuff together to um, to create this program as a way for women to who maybe aren't in a place to work one on one, and 
um, a group program would work better in their life. And yeah, so we're excited about that. And I'll, I'll have news on my website about it. And we're looking at probably March, February or March. Yeah, that sounds like a powerful trio that you have there for that program. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it's really exciting. Do you have a name for the program so that people could look it up, or is that still in the works? That's still in the works. We're, st we're still playing around with different things, so, yeah. Great. Well, Laura, I totally appreciate you coming on. This has been fantastic, and you provided so much extremely valuable information. Thank you so much. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, I highly recommend you to go to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. Uh, those ratings and reviews do make a difference, so if you could leave us a review, uh, that would be amazing, and it helps to get this podcast out to more and more people. So please go to summitforwellness.com slash iTunes, and that will take you right to our uh, podcast, and you can leave a rating and review there, and we will see everybody next time.